So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Erica and I'm an engineer and that's how I start most presentations when I go and speak to classrooms, when I go and speak to kids about engineering. Um, it's something I've done probably close to a few hundred times at this point. I started doing it about 10 years ago just sort of off the side of my desk while I was working as a manufacturing engineer and I've gone through a few transitions in my career. Now this is part of what I do for a living is talking about how to talk to kids about engineering and how to do it really well. So how many of you have volunteered before, or done something to do with kids in your non-work life? Yes? Okay, almost everybody, that's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say that our goal, Becky's and my goal, is to make this the best volunteer experience you've ever had. Okay, because we've been doing this a lot, we've been thinking about this a lot. Um, we've worked with National Engineering Month, we've worked with a program that the PEO runs called Engineer in Residence. And uh, now we've started to work with companies directly to do things like what we're gonna do here, which is to reach out to local schools and local school boards to give kids an idea of STEM. So a little bit about me, I actually grew up here. I'm from Walkerton originally, I'm a product of two schools that don't exist anymore. That sometimes happens, uh, Brant Central and then Walkerton District Secondary School back when we had OAC. And the first time I heard the word engineer was in grade 12. And I didn't hear it, you know, I had never heard it before that. So our goal, if nothing else, is to provide kids with an understanding of what they can do. So myself being an engineer, we've worked with PEO, as I said before, the engineering regulator. Um, that's been where we focused. But over the years, we've had the opportunity to work with other licensing bodies, such as OSET, that licenses the technicians and technologists, and with uh, Skills Ontario that looks at attracting young people to trades. We're very proud to partner with Bruce Power in this capacity because we really want to make sure that kids are aware of the full spectrum of STEM plus traits is what we're calling it. So please forgive me if I say engineer. What I actually mean is all of the jobs that are on that spectrum from STEM all the way through to trades. So how do I move forward here? Here we go. So things we're going to get out of today's session, there's not going to be a whole ton of room for chit chat because I know everyone wants to get home. Um, but maybe we could just do a quick couple popcorn answers on what you want to get out of today's session. You've signed up, presumably of your own free will, to be here, to be part of this program. What is it that you're hoping to get out of today's session? Um, just a few responses would be helpful at this point for me to understand what you're looking for. And hopefully I've got it. Just an interaction, an opportunity to, like you said, talk to, talk to some of the young kids. Perfect. And I've been involved with supervising referees and dealing with young kids for, like I said, up here for 28 years, and I've always enjoyed it, and I thought this was another opportunity to uh, give back. That's great. So that's a part of why you're here in the program in general. I guess, as far as our goals today, is there anything in particular you want from today? Uh, for me, I think it's just been organized. There's been a lot of emails going back. And yeah. I know some of the things that are probably like, I think were tough for me to overcome for others, and I, I think it's just Okay. Putting that all together, understanding what the next steps are. Yeah. Uh, how to align with the initiative. Break it down, know what you're doing yeah, next. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Well. I think we can cover that. I think for I me, think. It, was, it was actually just to learn more about it. Like, it, I I didn't think what I'd originally been asked for was a commitment. It was an indication of interest. So I wanted to learn more about it before jumping into it and all, this, <laughs> and all these things arrived. And I was like, well, I guess I'm in. <laughs> indication of interest. To commitment there's maybe a quick slide there yeah. especially with a, a newer type of program um, I, I think it's that's maybe a good thing to get out in the open up front is that the, this is a volunteer commitment and you are free to leave at some point if you need to or want to for any reason all that we ask is that you just make that clear um, because we do we, we know how discouraging that can be if someone just kind of ghosts and we don't really know what happened we don't want to give away your spot but um, that's leaving some kids and some teachers high and dry. So uh, we hope that you will enjoy this program and we'll kick it off uh, on the right foot today and then we'll continue to give you the support that you need to have a good experience throughout the school year. Okay, so we're gonna do introduction. We would do a, an activity. I'm gonna just verbally walk you through that part um, and talk about the impact that we're trying to create. Basically, this isn't about the, uh, the glamour or the prestige going out, this business of talking to kids. It really is about having that impact and making sure that they, they walk away with something and that they wouldn't have had if you hadn't got involved with the program. And tips and tricks. We can give you a few of those. So here we are asking the question that you were, that you were uh, responding to just a few minutes ago about your why for getting involved with this program. So we hear sometimes about giving back. I know for me, hello, come on in. Um, here that we, 
you know, I personally love to do this because I didn't have it as a kid. I had no idea what engineering was or what a technology job was, what that could have looked like. All I really had to work with was sort of the outlines of what my uncle did and what my dad did. And, you know, it didn't really seem like maybe there was a place for me in it. But once I got the information, I jumped on it and I loved it. So anyone else want to share your why for signing up to be a, a STEM outreach volunteer? Mm -hmm. I've got four daughters here globally. And, uh, you know, every day we're seeing, you know, Hobarts and, and different companies closing down and becoming quite uh, obvious that technology here, arena around here, if you want your family to stay here, is, is becoming one of the, the last few uh, markets to work in. I think even though I work in the market, you don't bring that home. I don't talk about work. So I sure. Think, you know, I have... My kid told me to tell you two things that my organization does. <laughs> so I, I think it's an excellent opportunity to reach out and, and sort of, you know, our kids as well as, as all the other kids that are around here show them that there are jobs that they're interested in. You know, Great. In a market that's growing, probably the largest market in Ontario, anywhere, Eastern Canada, happens to be right here. And I think a lot of them are looking out and yeah. you know, sort of grasping at straws. And For sure. For jobs that may not even exist. So it's about job opportunity, making our own families aware, as well as other people's families, I guess, other people's kids. I think this is a great thing to touch on because it's really different than it was when I went to school 20 years ago. It was just an automatic assumption. You're going to have to leave to go to school. You're going to have to leave to get, um, you know, a job that is, you know, in that sort of sphere. And it's not like that anymore. There really are these new opportunities. And um, you know, the decision makers at Bruce Power that we've been speaking with are very committed to this region and committed to getting more suppliers and more opportunities around here, seeing that connected to uh, mental health outcomes for youth, to greater self-esteem, to knowing that there is that opportunity for them. And I consider myself a bit of a member of a diversity group. I think among my classmates in engineering, there weren't that many of us that weren't from major cities. And you can see now, you know, I'm paying attention now. There's the Science Center. There's all these great things for the kids that live within the cities. But what is there for the country kids? So I think you're, you're bang on. You're really aligned with us. We always make an effort whenever we can to reach out to kids who aren't getting this message or getting this opportunity anywhere else. Beautiful. Okay, so this is a group of engineers in residence, just FYI. Uh, we don't give out those T-shirts anymore, but <laughs> that's kind of the idea. Everyone gets together and shares their ideas. So some of our goals with what I, with what we do, as I mentioned, uh, this is one of the things that we that we're very uh, excited about, changing the public perception as well as uh, breaking stereotypes and raising awareness mm -hmm. among young people, even just to get it on their radar and enhance the profile, get rid of some of the mystery. Um, we've had we've worked with over the years since we started in 2013. We've worked with over 5,000 volunteers. We have relationships now with 35 school boards across mostly Ontario. We'd love to go national someday. That's that's the dream. And when we totaled it all up, we realized we've created 20, 250,000 positive STEM experiences. So that's, some of that is in classroom, some of that is booths and other types of STEM clubs and other activities, field trips and so on. We've engaged a, across pretty broad spectrum of, uh, of activities. And we're proud to say that we've been able to, to you know, spread the message that far. It's really great. So know that you're becoming part of this bigger movement um, when you sign up through your employer to be part of this program. Again, a little more of the nuts and bolts of what that looks like for us is to facilitate these classroom-based opportunities. Um, we're drawing, as I said, from the full spectrum of engineers, technicians, STEM, trade professionals, and we want to make sure that they have good, positive, hands-on experiences. So I have an anecdote that I usually tell here around why hands-on is so important. Um, I, I think you brought, probably all can imagine uh, how many here have kids. Can I just can I speak to kids as a shorthand mostly? OK, so if you've seen kids or if you have your own kids and you know that they they learn by doing their especially if they're kinesthetic learners, right? Their minds open when their hands are busy and they start to really get a sense of doing it for themselves. So here is where. We're really mean. We make people actually build a tower out of newspapers and we see which one stands up the best. And it's a bit of empathy, right? If you're putting kids through something and then you're asking them to be judged maybe on what they did or didn't do. Um, that's it's, it's a good thing to go through and you see how the team dynamics work. And these are all just things for for you to be aware of, to have a little bit of empathy for what you're going to put your students through. 
Again, in the interest of time today, we're not going to do that. But the biggest takeaway we want to give you is that it's not really the activity that is the most important aspect of what you're going to create for them. It's the experience. It's the takeaway that they have in their brain when they leave that classroom is that was amazing. That was fun. I did something I didn't know I could do and I want to know more. Or it's, oh, that was hard. That made me feel stupid. I don't think I can do that. Insert negative self-talk here, right? And we really want to make sure that we're creating the first version of this. And so you as a facilitator, you it's not just on you. It's also with the teacher and they're, you know, sort of there as your backstop to help you create that positive experience. But just keep that in your mind that it's not about the technical prowess of your presenting. It's not about getting, getting every single word perfect. It's about you showing up, being a human being, being someone that you that they can relate to, using um, examples and experiences that you hope that they can climb into as well. Maybe they can see yourselves, see themselves in something that you share about yourself, whether it's that you love sports or that you used to take apart things as a kid, um, whatever that might be. And there's actually sort of a longer um, module that we can take you through. It's called sharing your story. And it kind of gives you, it's a little bit of a coaching thing. If anyone's been through coaching or therapy, even like, it's just some questions about yourself. What, what is that self-awareness that brought you to where you are? What motivated you to get to where you are? Because when you can share that, why that's very powerful to share that with the students rather than saying, I'm a director of making sure that X, Y, Z happens. Kids don't know what that means. Right. And you're going to, Right away, you're creating that intimidation factor, and that's the experience we don't want. That's not to say you can't share about your job, but you're going to be, be sure to do it in very accessible language. Anyway, back to the activity here. It's not all about the activity is what we wanted to emphasize here. It's about the experience. And so a big part of the experience itself is that you add on the debrief afterwards. So I'll just give you a chance to look those over. I don't like it when people read slides to me, so I'm not going to do it to you. Um, but anyway, I'll just emphasize that the thing you do afterwards, that takeaway, bringing that home, really stick the dismount, that's going to make the difference in terms of the experience that the kids are going to take away. So if all else falls apart, and it might in the classroom, that's totally fine. Um, manage your time so you have time to do a debrief. So in the case of the newspaper towers thing, that looks like, OK, let's go around and let's look at each tower. Let's commentate on it. What do we see about this one that worked really well? Team, tell us about your process. How did it go? Showing interest in them and encouraging them to recognize what they did well. And if it failed, what did you learn? Right. Really framing that in a positive way and saying, like, that's what everybody does when they try and do something for the first time. Sometimes things go wrong, but we learn from them and we keep moving forward. Key messages. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We do have a whole bunch of prepared um, lesson plans that you can use if you do. I, I said it's not about the activity, but we have activities um, and they have key messages in them. So you don't have to make one up from scratch unless you want to. Um, every solution that means like every newspaper tower around the room will have something positive in it. And you want to do this um, to help them understand that it's not really about um, finding the best one. I don't I personally don't think that competition is a great um, frame for the activity because it leaves you with winners and losers and there are a lot fewer winners than <laughs> right necessarily so if, if you can find a way to say well this one was clearly the cheapest because you did it with so few materials good job and this one is clearly going to be the best in an earthquake situation so good job or you know what I mean you can find different design criteria or sort of outcomes that you can that you can find to, to accentuate there this is huge this is a big part of what teachers tell us they want from their volunteers connected to a real life experience. Maybe this is something you've done in your job here at Bruce Power. Maybe it's something you did in your co-op job. Maybe it's something that you did as a volunteer. Doesn't really matter. You're providing that connection. I don't know, I don't know how many people remember their science classes <laughs> and how dry they could seem at times. There are kids there that are just starving to understand why do we need to learn this? What is this for anyway? And you can provide that answer. You can fill in that blank. And a lot of the time, teachers don't know how to do that. So that's a big part of what your, your value add when you show up. So you can think about that ahead of time. Again, you don't have to have it totally scripted and perfect, but thinking about ways that you can apply what they just learned here. This is why it matters. Or this is the time I went on a project <coughs> and something went great or something went really wrong and they'll eat it up. That's really great stuff. 
Um, so I talked already about the being encouraging and finding something. Kids are going to chirp at each other, and hopefully the teacher will help you keep that under control again. But just knowing that you want to create that positive experience, do as much as you can to assert your influence as the guest speaker to say, no, 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 actually, this one's great because X, Y, Z kind of thing. Do you, you know what I mean? Anyone who's been around kids knows what I'm talking about. Referee, right? <laughs> um, Open-ended questions, presenting failures as uh, opportunities to learn. Don't say good referee. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're being a referee, right? Um, who knows? <laughs> I'm very off. Who knows what growth mindset is? Who's heard of that before? Okay, a little bit. Mm. So this is, um, again, this is an example of something that we talk about in another one of the webinars, which are all available online for you to watch at your leisure if you would like to invest the time. Um, when you refer to inherent ability or a fixed mindset, you are automatically excluding the kids to whom this does not come 100% naturally. If they struggle at all with math, if they have trouble visualizing anything, if they don't get it right away, they're going to think, not for me, can't do it, never will be able to do it. That's fixed mindset. What teachers are learning more and more now is that you can promote a growth mindset that says basically, I don't know how to do this yet, but I will. And everything that we're learning that science is learning now about neuroplasticity and the way the brain can heal itself and grow itself, um, there's more and more evidence to say that this is actually the way our minds work. And we just need to actually be in the mindset to know that just because you're struggling with something right now, your tower fell down today, that doesn't mean that you won't get this and you won't go on to, to strive in this. So it's a pretty powerful um, idea. And we have... The lights on. Sorry, is anyone uncomfortable with that? Or would you like them dimmed just like this? Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, sorry for the interruption. Nope, that's and okay. Help yourself to snack. The cookies in the far end containers are from a previous function, just so that you know that they weren't ordered specifically for here, but you're welcome to have them. They left them behind. But the cookies and the packages and cheese and crackers is all brand new stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Okay. So this is just one example of one of those things that now that you know about this, that word yet, that'll stick out in your mind, right? And hopefully you'll remember to use it when you're in front of the kids and you can help them say, hey, this isn't something you understand right now, but keep working at it. You will get it, right? That That's an example of being encouraging and promoting a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset. You don't want to get up in front, of the t in front of the students and say, look, if you've got the right stuff, you can do this. You can be in STEM or you can be in trades. Either you got it or you don't. Opposite of the message we want to convey, right? Because the kids that think they can, they're going to try. They might get there. They might not. It doesn't matter. The point is that this, it's, it's, it's our job to be encouraging and to ask them to, if they're interested, to give it a shot. Any questions, clarifications on this? I went through it pretty fast. But I'm seeing nods, which I find encouraging. Comments, questions? It's good? Useful? OK, awesome. So that, that is how you would do the part after. Now we're going to go sort of backwards a little bit to talk about how to create an impact. So through the design of your lesson and preparing it, we really want to think about messaging. So some of you may, might have had components of communication in your job. This is going to prepare you well, right? It's not just about the victory or lack thereof in the daily, you know, in the daily grind and the, the quest to get things done. It's also what people know about it. It's about the narrative around it. So we really feel at this point that there is a disconnection. There's a lack of understanding in general about STEM and trades in society. And it ends up really kind of resulting in a disconnect between who could be great in STEM and trades and who's actually signing up. In general, we think that more people could do this than think they could do it. There are creative types, there are change the world types. We'll say it, it's, it's also sometimes break down along gender lines, right? You mentioned your daughters. They might not automatically be getting that message or really feeling like this is something that's for them. So when we define it on our terms, we really want to think about the purpose, the importance, and what kind of a makeup in terms of diversity we have. And so I mentioned gender. We can also look at other types of diversity, right down to the way you think, where you're from, what your background is, um, along with the sort of other things that we think about in general, along with diversity. We want everyone to feel like they could belong. Um, so again, when we really focus on the why, remember I said, like, think about who you were as a kid. Think about what motivated you. You come with, to the classroom with your why, you're really going to be that much more accessible. 
And if you're willing to stand up there and, and sort of be a human being in front of them, which I sense all of you are going to, uh, you're going to do really well at, it's, it really gives you a chance to be, um, to have a, a, a much larger impact than if you just came up and, you know, spewed a bunch of stuff about, you know, the technical side of your job, right? I think unconsciously, at least some of us go in feeling like we need to impress people, we need to lead with the best stuff we know, um, and it can be almost subconscious, right? This is not a job interview. It's not your LinkedIn profile. Your job isn't to make yourself look impressive. In fact, if anything, you want to look less impressive so that you're not intimidating, right? So again, just another one of those shifts we want you to keep in mind. When you show up and you talk about your non-STEM trades parts of you um, and reflect on your why, um, I, for example, talk a lot about how I love to dig in the mud when I was a kid. And that left me feeling like, hey, like I really like having a tangible impact on the world. I'm not going to be a scientist that just goes and does theoretical stuff. No problem with scientists, but I'm not going to do that. That's not, right, that's not what's right for me. And thinking about um, after that, when I saw the periodic table, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. All the stuff in the universe is right there. We got it. It's right the here. Yeah. It didn't do much for you at the time. Oh, okay. Well, see, everyone's story is a little bit different. And to be honest, the dots only connect backwards. When I think about, like, oh, my gosh, like that grade 12 chemistry class, uh, grade 11 chemistry class, I guess, um, statistics, when I learned it in university, hated it, thought it was so boring, so tedious, so ugh, yuck. But then I graduated and started working in automotive manufacturing, and I signed up for Six Sigma training. That's all about statistics. It's using statistics to solve operational problems. All of a sudden, I'm the hero because I know how to do this statistics thing, and I'm helping lead a team to make decisions about how we can improve efficiencies, get rid of rejects, get rid of scrap. And I got my Six Sigma black belts off that. That was actually a pivotal part of my career. So perfect example of when you don't see the point of something, as I didn't in university, it's tedious, it's awful, it's intimidating. But when you get it, when you see the why, when you see what you can do with it, who it impacts, why it matters, what's in it for me, total game changer, completely different. So this is, again, another example. We say if you're going to put a robot in front of kids, some kids will love it just because it's a robot. They'll be like, wow, very into the programming, very into the pneumatics, very into whatever. Some of the kids. Others, they'll need a different angle. They need to, they need to know what that robot's going to do. Who's it going to help? Why does it matter if that thing fails or, or doesn't, right? Then that switches on the part of the brain that says, okay, I care about this. Now I'm going to listen. Now I'm going to get involved. Now I think I might like to program it, right? So... This leads really nicely into my next slide, which reflects, well, a lot of this is about gender, and it's also about stereotypes in general. So I have two daughters, and at first I said, no pink, no way, no way. We have so much pink around our house, and there's not a lot I can do about it. So on the one hand, framing it and saying, that's great. You know, this little girl, she feels pretty. She's happy. That's good. We have to be very careful, though, to recognize that as we embrace this, as we, you know, see girls embracing pink and frilly things, that we're not also discounting her because she could be a nuclear engineer, right? She could be a physicist. There's no way of knowing, even though our brains are getting trained to put people in boxes and say, you're either smart or you're pretty. I experienced this <laughs> firsthand as a kid, right? I was a smart girl, right? So that meant certain things about me and maybe gave me a little more freedom. For girls like this that are the girly girls and get into it, just keep reminding them you, you don't have to be just one thing. And we're going against a whole lot of societal conditioning in saying this, right? So just be aware of it. I, I think that's the best thing I can say. Again, there's lots and lots of information out there about unconscious bias, different things that are in our heads. You know, when we look at certain people and we make, um, we make judgments, we make assumptions about them, they're sometimes happening at a subconscious level. Just try to be aware of that. If you observe yourself, you know, seeing students making certain assumptions about them, oh, I get, I bet you that kid's X, Y, Z. Just try not to. Try to assume the best of everyone and give them a shot and, and make them feel welcome and, and remember that you want them to have a positive experience too. Again, this is a whole other body of research. I just went to a conference at the University of Waterloo. Very depressing research about how as early as age six, Girls get the message that they're not good at math and boys are good at math. 
math equals boys and uh, arts equals girls or something like that. And it's so crazy because it's not even true. There are, there's other research that shows that when you remove that bias, the girls do just as well as boys on, on the tests. But it's very, it's very difficult. So, so again, a lot of you who are men, when you stand up in front of the class and you say girls are every bit as good at this as boys, girls and boys are equally good at math, that is going to mean a lot to them. And encouraging them, don't be mean to the girls, don't pick on the girls. I know this is a lot to expect of you. There's, again, there's so much conditioning here, there's so much history. But these are the types of things, you know, this male figure is saying to this male figure, you individually, you suck at math. But when it's a girl that he's speaking to, he's generalizing it to the entire gender. Unfortunately, he's just playing along with this generalization that's out there in the culture, it's out there in society. So we're not asking you to solve it in one afternoon with the kids. Just be aware of it, do what you can to speak up against it and say, no, nope, girls and boys are equally good at math. End of story, <clears throat> moving on. Um, you can also talk about you know, multiple intelligences. <coughs> everyone's, good at, everyone's good at different things. And maybe this little boy, see he's playing soccer, but he's not very happy. Maybe he would be happier playing ba doing ballet, right? Maybe this girl wants to play soccer and that's fine. Like it's totally fine for people to do what they want to do and we don't have to fit into these boxes anymore. Okay. A little more here. Really terrible messages in the culture in general. This is a little more on that girls and math thing. Giving them pink stuff. Again, nothing inherently wrong with pink. It's all the baggage that comes with pink that says you're pretty, you're decorative, and you're useless. You're probably dumb if you're pretty. That is just a message we want to try and hit head on and, and, and switch around best we can. Um, personally, when I talk to kids, I, I will sometimes, <laughs> I try to dress a little prettier and then make an effort to say, I'm an engineer and I have kids, you know, I, ha I have a husband. How about that? I think that that is one of the things that not all girls who were smart really necessarily thought like, oh, I'm the smart girl. Will boys like me if I, you know, if I grow up to be an engineer or grow up to be in STEM? I, I think it's a great idea to put them, to put that to rest. So, anyone have any examples? What are examples that kids, kids in general, receive about STEM and trades? Where do they get them? What's missing? Any ideas? Well, I think, in, I think that a lot of people think that you have to be like extremely physical fit to be in the trades. Okay. So, like, and in some trades more than others, obviously, <clears throat> but, you know, they, they're, they might think that uh, they wouldn't be able to um, pull conduit or turn that valve or whatever. Um, Is that boys smaller. or girls that might oh, think? girls. In or general. Or even smaller guys. Sure. Yeah. Right? Like, they may think that the option's not there for them because they're not six feet tall and 220 pounds of muscle. You know? Great. Like, seeing that, that you, you what, whatever your size, you bring something different to, something diverse to the, to the trade and, and, so, for example, when I was an operator, um, you know, there was another operator that I worked with who was afraid of heights. So I would do all the heights, and he would do all the big valves, and it worked out just fine. Beautiful. He was also afraid of spiders, so I had to go to the pump house. But, <laughs> um, but you know, but um, so I think I think there's a sort of a misconception there, and I've heard that from from guys from different cultures as well. Like I worked with those Filipino guys who who were worried about who were worried about being able to physically do some of the work that they're asked that they would be asked to do. Okay. But it's fine. They just get a pipe match. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's Mechanical advantage is a beautiful it. thing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I think that for in particular trades, that's something I've seen now that I work more with engineers in in a different role. Um, like personally, uh, adverse power anyways it seems to me that um, female engineers um, um, actually, like I've actually asked for some of the numbers because I'm involved with them in nuclear, mm -hmm. um, actually get a pretty fair shake, I, I must say. And, and by that I mean, Sushan, because they get opportunities for promotion mm -hmm. just as much as the young men do. Mm -hmm. There are not as many coming in the like the beginning, but when it comes time for, for opportunities, it, it seems... Fair, for me, anyways, fairly equal. 
Yeah. I think we're fairly merit based and not. I, I like in, in the engineering the department. I, into the I agree. Conversation at all. Yeah. Like, that's one thing I, I would sort of <clears throat> probably say about Rispile, right? That yeah. I, I see that when you look at the numbers, actually, like almost 40% of sort of next level in engineering is female. Mm -hmm. What a great message to give back to enough, students, right? Yeah. It's, it's not true. It's not true. It's not true in the trades. No, it's, it's, not true it's, trades. Well. it's like three no. percent in trades. I think. Yeah. I'm a, I know my daughters. In that yeah. Kind of trade that you know, Mike, we've met Marcy before. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mostly male-dominated trade. And the first thing when she came in, I said, "Well, I can't bring her in there. She's too good looking." Yes, she got, she, her, she, got, she got her she bucks from her mom. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so she's got to be tough as well. Exactly. And then she has to have personality, which she, she does have the personality to speak out and show that you know, she's not only she cute, she's yeah. smart and can do all of this stuff, right? So, yeah. So it's, it was tough. You know, when I tried to talk to her to go into this program, she looked at me like deer in the headlights and she's excelling at it now, right? So Amazing. You know, we're seeing we're seeing a shift, and you know as the technology improves, you know, at least in, in some of the craft that we, we employ, technology was was fairly stagnant for a long time, and it wasn't all that sophisticated. Um, it was in certain areas, but in the in the, in the larger scale of things. Um, but what we found in, in the past while is we've kind of gone into sort of for the technology creators that the the most uh, I mean, the approach is really not managing diversity. It's it's more about making it a catalyst for for, for collaboration. And um, great. And what we're finding, and uh, I know Marcy probably in this type of environment where she's gone, um, is is that um, you know you get different cultures, different groups, and in the past it's always been you know the folks that are are good with their hands go to the craft that are an academic, and the academics don't look at the craft that they go to the uh, they go to the, uh, the professional jobs or the technology jobs. And what we're seeing is that because the incomes have more aligned um, over the last while, especially with the, the, the attrition, that you have them looking in different size and you have different cultures coming in, you have different genders coming in. And some of the best performing teams that we see have working are the ones that are highly diverse because you don't just have that one perspective of I'm a mechanic or I'm an NDT guy and this is how I thought about things. This is how the guy that trained me thinks about things. You have someone that says, well, what about this? And if they are the pretty girl, the thing looks ugly. It's a horrible looking product. Let's design it to look better. <laughs> There's always a different perspective, perspective, but from the same base education, instead, but from multiple education. So we're seeing it change even in the, in the trades, but it's slower for sure. You just did an amazing job of explaining the messaging around diversity. That's great. We weren't going to get into it, but that's exactly what we want to say. Is it? It's not just something we want to put up with, but we want to embrace and really realize this is the way to productivity, innovation, all that good stuff. And I, I love that there are examples of it in your workplace. That's and if you keep hiring people who look great like you, stuff. you're not going to grow as a team, right? Like that's, that's so true. You yeah. Have to, you have to diversify. You have to have different cultures and different looks and different different backgrounds and yeah. all those things. And, I mean, that's part of what makes growth happen. It makes a stronger team. Yeah. Yeah. One of the hardest things about, uh, so regardless of how things get set up, like whether you tend to find more you know, one group in particular um, careers and one another, it tends to reinforce itself through an image. So like I have, like, uh, I've got an uncle who, like, the example of trades, he's a bigger guy, he's in trades. And so if I grow up and I see that, and I see another bigger guy in trades, et cetera, I might think, okay, well, probably like, like even subconsciously, that tends to be something more for whatever. I'm a smaller guy, it's not really my thing. Right. But for someone else who grows up and has a bigger guy, I might say, well, if he's in trades, that's probably what I should be. So the next generation grows up, you have that same that same image without doing something to, to stop that, even without necessarily um, like verbally reinforcing it. It just kind of yeah. sees society the way it is, and you just assume that it has to continue to be that way. Totally. The ways we get belonging, the way the way ways we drive meaning, they're they're not always spoken, right? So anything you can do to kind of say to bring that up and say, look, here's what it is. It's about solving problems, helping people, you know. And in the case of of the Bruce in particular, you can talk about the ways that it benefits the community. That's going to be something that has nothing to do with how big you are, how small you are, what your gender is. If you want to be part of that. That's a great way to frame what we do in STEM and trades, right? The, the benefit that it has, the impact that it has, if you want to be part of that, then you belong. You're invited, right?
I think you touched on that generational aspect as well. Like I know that like, when I grew up, like, a lot of my family um, came from like working level kind of groups. So it was all there was a lot of pressure because um, I was one of the first. So it was the first person in my kind of broader family that went to college. Um, and there was a lot of pressure to, why are you going to college? You should be out working and earning money and things mm. like that. And at the time, to be honest, part of me was like, yeah, I'm interested in doing that, but I'd like to earn the money that these guys earn, so I, I can do computer science. Mm -hmm. um, but there was then a kind of growth of that in the UK, and right? I love the same in Canada, where everybody was getting pushed to go to college or university, and now you, you get this huge group of, of you know, like this glut of professional qualified people they can't get jobs because nobody wants to hire them because as soon as they get their job, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And there's a, 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 a demand in the trades and you know, a lot of the other types of jobs. And as you pointed out, the gap between the salary skills has changed dramatically. From yeah. I was younger. So, yeah, you know, you know if in my family, it was like I'm from blue collar background. And, yeah. But it was the opposite. They were like, you will go to university and you will get, and, and we all did. Yeah. But then I ended up in a trade. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> there was a job, and yeah. you know, and, and it turned out to be a very well-paid job down the road, of course. <laughs> but, but you know, my point is, like, it was like the opposite. You will, and now I'm saying to my kids, get a trade. Like, yeah. you don't need, you know what I mean? You don't need to go. To, you don't need to go to my well, one's a computer science one. <laughs> but, but, you know what I mean? Like, it's like it's the office turned now. Like, the the just, wheel turns and yeah. turns, doesn't it? The, yeah. It, I, and I, I think I agree. There's so many. The, the spotlight's been put on the trades where if you want to make a bunch of money, this is where you go. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, we're probably creating something that we're going to regret down the road, where we now have fewer people going and investing in, you know, four or five, seven years of university to come out thinking they're going to yield the same, plus have no more responsibility than a tradesperson and be responsible for those tradespeople. We're hearing more and more. I'm seeing a lot of. Um, Folks dropping out of university programs that have decided to shift gears because, oh, I don't know what I'm going to get out of this, or there's no jobs. I don't want to be a teacher. Yeah. And and I'm hearing that a lot in the HR to bring that up with. So I think we're creating a new problem that we're going to be talking about a little differently, maybe 10, 15 years down the road. Yeah. But it's probably a shift that's good for now. Well, with all the and we hire a lot of, like in ops, we hire a lot of engineers yep. and university degree uh, folks. Um, they start in the field in the trade just like I did, yep. um, with the you know plan that they would get authorized in the control eventually. So, so if you're if you're that kind of <clears throat> that kind of academic that likes to be more hands on, then you know there's an opportunity to have that degree and still make a trade. S certainly, yeah. I, I think that that if, problem is a lot of young people are quite short sighted. Yes, they are. You're right. Yeah. So if they have that that larger, higher level vision of, hey, if I've got a degree and then I still want to shift into a yes. trade, yes. I'll be almost irreplaceable, yes. provided I'm good at, yes. at what I do. An aspect of both that, that is pretty rare. Yeah. But uh, at least for my kids in particular, I can see they're pretty short-sighted. You know, if, they, if there was something shiny over here that they could use, yeah, they'd I know. probably yeah. go there. Um, and I think a lot that I'm seeing come through the door that are in that, that camp that I was talking about. It's short sighted. That's the thing. Well, they come in. I got two years through my engineering degree and decided I want to go into trades. Holy smokes, why didn't you finish that? You know how hard it is to finish two years mm -hmm. of engineering. That's not, mm -hmm. a, that's not a joke course, but uh, a program. But uh, it's, there's definitely turmoil out there right now. And, we discussed this at the last, uh, sorry, Sue, go ahead. No, that's okay. I was, I was just going to say, if I could just share um, one of the statistics through the school board. So I'm currently doing, I retired a year and a bit ago, and um, I'm doing a contract with Bruce Power to the A's between industry and our local school boards to help advance uh, STEM education. And I'm not a technical person myself, but I spend a lot of time in community relations, so um, they asked me if I would consider doing this. And, What's going on right now with the uh, Ministry of Education is that by 2024, they're uh, expecting about 40% of graduating high school students to be going into the trade. But the reality is, and so those are kids that are in grade six now, 2024 is not that far away. Mm -hmm. uh, so the kids that are in grade six today are the ones that are going to be hitting that mark. And the high schools in the Blue Water um, and the Bruce Gray Catholic District School Board um, 
we're doing really well in the skill um, or the high skills major, secondary high skills major programs. We're we're top of the heap in the province actually. However, the number of actual students that are in the STEM related subjects or technical uh, type programs in the schools is across the province is about four to fourteen percent. So there's a huge gap to reach that 40% graduating in 2024 when there's only 4 to 14% of the high school students actually in those technical programs mm -hmm. right now. So I'm not sure how the gap's going to be met. And one other piece just to what you were speaking about, um, I don't know if any of you have met Daryl Spector from Formation. I've been working a lot with the STEM, uh, or, or STEM supplier uh, company uh, through OCNI, and we're trying to partner together so that we were offering something to the school boards that we're not all stumbling over each other, knocking on their door, that it's an organized, sort of concerted effort. And Daryl had a similar path, but um, he, all along he'd been told, oh, you can be an engineer, you can be an engineer. And what he said to the teachers at that training day was that he actually said, by the grace of one tech teacher saying to him, that's fine, you go off to be an engineer, but come to and take one semester of tech at least before you go, which he did. And it actually put him into a middle no rate. Um, apprenticeship, and then he did become an engineer as well, and now he has his own robotics company. And he said that made him a far better engineer because he understood how to use the tools that are put in the hands of the tradespeople that he, as an engineer, would have been designing. And without that experience, he wouldn't have ended up with sort of the outlook for the type of business that he has to make that work for the people who have to use them as well as for the people who have to design them. So, just two interesting pieces that came out of the the yeah, absolutely. And also how to talk to them, right? Like, there, there's a great engineer that ops has stolen away from Sushank, who has a uh, college a college diploma in uh, um, like electrical techno technology, and then he also has an engineering degree. And he is really good with maintenance. You know, he really knows how to talk to them about what he wants them to go check and look up, and like it's just you know what I mean. He's good. It's going to be a great shift manager someday, Sushank. Right. <laughs> I'm looking forward. Yeah. <laughs> so I love where we're going with this conversation because it's leading right into this slide, which is beautiful. Um, this is a little bit, we have to have a flow chart somewhere, right? We've got to exercise our, that part of our brains here. Here are all the kids that would be great in STEM and trades. But this is only the very small portion who are going to know that they're going to be good at it and they're going to choose it on their own. So here we are. This is all of you over here, and you're going back and you're speaking to these kids, probably, by and large. Oh, right? Yeah. That's kind of the default, right? That's who comes to the camps and Yep, everything. exactly. They like the robot because it's a robot, or they're maybe related to you, so they have that really good first-hand understanding of what goes on. We want to talk about getting these other groups of kids. Here's a kid who's a great communicator, awesome leader, right? Very good at the STEM. They've still got the math and science, but their sort of hallmark feature, you might look at them and say, wow, you've got a really outgoing personality. Maybe you should go be a politician or something, right? However, if we rejig our mind, we say, remember, we need that diversity of skills. We need someone who's outgoing, someone who can lead, you know, organize people. Maybe that's where uh, your example um, would be right here, right? Um, what about kids who want to change the world? They want to have an impact. They want to make a difference, right? STEM. Trades, great way to do that. What about people who are super, I don't know, really social or um, I'm running out of examples here, really small, you know, they're maybe a bit built kind of physically small, right? They might not be, they might not have been getting the message by default. So we can think about all of these different other little subgroups that make up the big, the bigger student population. Um, think about how we can include them and specifically make them feel welcome. So this is, again, one of our really easy math type equations. You take an activity, you add a message to it, it's going to produce an impact. And it could be good impact, bad impact. We never really know, but we can do some things to design it so that it's going to be a good impact for the majority. So because we like data, we dug into all of the research, and there is quite a bit, actually, into the best ways to talk to young people about engineering and, and technology. Um, and this is from one done by the National Academy of Engineering in the States. They ran a campaign called Changing the Conversation. If you're bored sometime, Google it. They have a number of little videos that are very humorous and well done. And sort of change, they're talking about uh, challenging those stereotypes and kind of bumping up against them and, and seeing how we can shake things up. And 
this was a point someone made it about the diversity of thinkers, right? When we have a more diverse team, it's going to be more productive. Lots of things are going to happen. And if you know the National Engineering Month uh, campaign actually used There is a Place for You as its slogan, right? So this is the outreach campaign that happens every March to interest young people in uh, engineering and technology. So there is a place for you. How much more explicit could we get? We're not an elite group of people who you have to be, you know, you have to get 100% in school or you have to be able to take apart a robot and put it back together all by yourself. You don't need to be that you, you know, there is a place for you in engineering. You bring your strengths to the table, as you were saying. Um, engineering and technology shape the world around us. This is a great one to talk about with, I, I talked to, uh, I think it was about a grade five class. And I said, what did life look like 50 years ago? How did people get around? What did they do for fun? You know, th those sorts of things. How about today? Yeah, pretty different, right? What about 50 years from now? What's it going to look like again? What's the common denominator through all of that? It's all engineering. It's all technology. Another one I love. This is true no matter where you work or what discipline of engineering or technology or trades you're in. It's all in essentially about using creativity and imagination. It's about solving problems, turning ideas into reality. So let's say you're looking at something that's broken. You need it to be fixed. You figure out in your imagination what the fixed thing looks like, and then you, you know, get it there. Or maybe you're designing something completely new. Every single invention, sorry, I'm nerding out for a second here. Every single thing that exists here that was made by humans was an idea at one point. Someone had to come up with the idea, come up with the blueprint, design a process, make it happen. That is so empowering for kids to know they can be part of that. And this is the last piece. This is the people piece. Not surprisingly, um, either because we're socialized that way or born that way, who knows? Girls, women find this part really compelling. It's, it's shown up in the, the data that the National Academy of Engineering collected. <clears throat> Knowing that this is essential to safety, health, and happiness. Okay, there's a whole bunch more words there, but that's the biggest thing. Safety, health, and happiness. You're, this matters to people. This is impacting people. It's changing their lives. It's about people working for people here locally, right? And also around the world. Engineers and technologists and tradespeople make a world of difference. Again, that's been the National Engineering Month uh, slogan as well. So hopefully this is making you think a little bit of how you could integrate this. We don't expect you to read these word for word to your students. However, maybe you can come up with examples. You can use certain phrases. You can um, kind of use them when you're telling your own story and uh, really start them thinking off on a different track because chances are they're not going to expect you to be bringing stories to them like this. Any thoughts, questions? Ideas. You, we're going to provide a copy of these slides, by the way, so you can have this to look at any time you need it. One little thing that we are doing with the um, elementary students, I know you're working with secondary teachers and that sort of thing, but just what we're trying to build is uh, steam clubs because we haven't had that in our local schools. Last year we funded and piloted five. This year we have 23, and there's 39 elementary schools in the Blue Water System, and we hope by next year have all 39 if they're willing on board. We haven't been going around telling them what to do or what to think, but just offering support for it. So um, one of the things that I really like out of it is that the uh, teacher coordinator in charge is that she's really recommending that these teams don't go out and just buy a robot uh, because you can get all kinds of cute things, you know, in the children's education departments because all you end up doing is going to a website and downloading something that makes the robot move and nobody's learning anything out of that. So what they're recommending are micro bits where students have to learn to code and uh, they're using like little LED lights and uh, so they, they're starting to learn that way and then the next step from there will be build a robot. So right now they're working um, basically in the grade three to six range, uh, but trying to look for something a little bit more for the senior students of seven and eight, but because they're more involved in sports and things, they're harder to capture. But we're trying to build it so that it's available there when you're in elementary. By the time you get to secondary, there's the other stuff that's going on that, uh, you know, whether it's through the teachers, mentors, or um, clubs don't work so well in high school because of students' teams and, and jobs and that sort of thing, but something in your education. And then, you know, hoping that it matches at the community college, um, the, the apprenticeships and the university levels. How well, many are you trying to build that pipeline? FOL and FRC, the first revenue and it's really it's really patchy like there's mm -hmm. no consistent thing and it doesn't all come through the school board so for example in King Carden, the first robotics mm -hmm. club there which is doing great and yeah. uh, Frank Williams just succeeded in getting fourteen thousand dollars out of some sort of a local uh, dragon's den kind of a hundred people uh, who shares come 
100 people a share, thank you. Uh, I think it's the hot group or something out of Lutnow that I'm thinking of, that's more like the Dragon's Den. Um, and they always need help, right? And they've had to move out of their space. But um, that's a good example. But that is not a school board initiative. No, it's not. It's, it, it's community, it's community or industry driven and that yeah. sort of thing. So there are a couple other schools that want to get those going. And we're going to try to match them up with some of these OCMI partners and uh, try to help them. St. Mary's has Yes, as well. you're right. Yeah. 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 Old town has. I'm not sure. Is it Vince Cowley that's involved in that? Yeah. Yeah. Because I've seen a lot of folks from FRC in concurrent bring the mm -hmm. robotics. Doesn't matter if their parents were are farmers or were farmers, are technologists or those are the most resourceful problems solving. They were trying to think that you know you would initially say, hey, you wouldn't I wouldn't see you becoming an engineer or a trade person. So yeah. I've seen like those kind of things really make a huge difference. And we haven't forgotten here on Perth and the Yamaha Mainland District School Board either. We're just not as far as advanced in our communications with them, but they're actually more far. They're further advanced in what they're doing than what we're doing locally, but that doesn't mean that they still don't need your help because I mean, there's still a good student population. So sorry, I'm digressing. You can tell me That's okay. Part. No, we, we, I'm excited we look that. forward to continuing <laughs> these conversations. We think this is very exciting because this gives us an opportunity to help inject so some of the impact. Coming, is basically Absolutely. And, and I think love you guys to, you know, once you get rolling and get excited about it, you know, tell three people and get them to tell three people because we're going to be needing to feed this pipeline of mentors because some people will have to come and go from it over time. As well. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is a really good setup to the next thing we wanted to talk about, which was sending volunteers into the classrooms is a really vital part of the puzzle. It's not the only thing that's going on out there as far as STEM and trades. You mentioned um First Robotics League, uh, First Lego League, that kind of thing. Um, Rebecca, my business partner, my colleague, is also is running one of those with her kids. Um, they just got it started, and she was saying how impressed she was with the values that they have, the, of a value around inclusion, really talking about teamwork and mm -hmm. making sure that they're getting the process right. So again, this really aligns with our philosophy of get the experience right for the kids. It's not just about the outcome. It's not just about the technology per se. Um, the one thing that I would say with something like that is that it's only going to attract those who think they're already good at this, right? So there is a little bit of that self-selection bias that I showed you in that first slide with these are the kids who would show up anyway. So being mindful of that and knowing that when you go into a classroom, you're talking to everybody, right? That's an opportunity to bring along those other groups. Maybe ideally that good, you know, they have a good taste of something in the classroom and then that encourages them to step forward to do something a little more intensive, like one of those extracurriculars. So this is a picture of two guys very proudly sporting their medals that they won at the um, National Engineering Month bridge building competition. I don't know, has anyone ever been part of a bridge building competition? Yeah, okay. Good. We have nothing against bridge building competitions for the record. They don't tell the whole story, as you can imagine, right? And so we, we think that uh, adding something else to bridge building can really enhance them. This is a group uh, who just won the mathletics competition. All right. So again, nothing wrong with mathletics, making math fun, making it uh, making it something the cool kids do. Um, we wonder about the rest of the kids that aren't in these photos, though. Did they have as good a time? Were they left feeling intimidated like they couldn't do it? If they were, how could we do that differently? How could these groups do it differently to make things more inclusive and friendlier to everyone? I'm glad you asked. So one example is by adding a different message. So here's a bridge building activity here. They put, uh, I guess they're all different ways. Some of them have special machines that can break the bridges. In this case, they're just adding weight to a bucket here. It's suspended between two arbitrary surfaces, right? So this covers the geometrics and the construction aspect the kids can learn whose bridge is strongest and they can talk about that, but they're not really learning anything about the why. Remember how I said the why is important? These are blank tables. There's nothing here as far as we know that they're learning about the why. So the Engineers Without Borders um, chapter in, in uh, Vancouver came up with this little exercise and they added this on. You can see it's a city of trail and they give the kids, okay, great. Now that you've got a strong bridge, you know how you're going to do it. You've got your hands around the technology. Where are you going to put it and why does it matter? What if you were living here? Where would you want to see it? What impact would that have to your life now that the bridge is there? Oh, you could get to the uh, emergency room faster. That's good. 
How about how long it's going to take you to get to work in the morning? Get them thinking about the why and the impact that it has on human terms. There you go. You've just brought in some of those other groups of kids. They're, now they're interested. Now they're paying attention. Oh, and I guess I had a free body diagram there as well, just to say, as a bit of a critique of the, you know, the thing where you remove all context and you just look at the problem, that's got a time and a place, right? However, add the context back in. We encourage you to do that when you're, when you're doing these types of activities. So again, just know that the message is very important. That's going to be a big part of the experience that you're creating. Those four messaging guidelines, very, they're great. Uh, ideas into reality, importance of diversity, um, creativity and imagination, people working for people. Um, understand your audience. If, if you get a chance to talk to the teacher ahead of time and ask them like, what's popular? What are they, what are they into? What are they going to understand? Using examples that, you know, are accessible to both the boys and the girls, ideally. Um, that's going to give you the best, the best shot of having an impact there. Okay, we're motoring right along. We have time for other comments, questions. Good? One of the things, if I could just say, um, when you get talking to the teachers and learning about your audience of students, the one thing to remember, and it's not that it has to be your focus or mention in the classroom, it's just for your own knowledge. Um, the socioeconomics outside of the Bruce Power Bubble are very different, right? So you start getting a little bit further afield and you're into very different economic and social situations for some families and, and within our own community too, but we don't see it as, as much as we do in other areas. So a really creative principal at the Erin Terra School, um, she had about uh, 24 students last year that were clearly at risk of not succeeding in their year at all with school uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And she wasn't one of the ones that we funded. She heard about the pilot funding after it had expired. And uh, she went ahead and formed her own STEAM club with her students anyway. And she does it at lunchtime because if her students are all bussed in and she knows that if they have to stay after school, they can't come to the club because there's no way to get a ride home for them without transportation. So transportation is a good issue too. But this teach or this principal um, with those students, and some of them had some you know social problems as well, like a little bit loners. They maybe moved a lot, didn't really have a social circle at school. Maybe getting into fights out on the playground. Um, every school seems to have a sports team, but hardly any schools have a STEM club, right? Mm -hmm. So you got this yin and yang of interest. She developed this um, program at the lunchtime. The student, uh, there were a few of the students that were in a little bit of trouble out in the playground, so she, she used it um, as part of the discipline program where for the um, uh, detentions, she had these students, it wasn't all at the same time, she would tell them, I want you to serve your detention over the lunchtime in the, in the steam club today. And your job is to just go and watch. You're not to take part in anything, but you just go and watch and see what's going on. And then I'll talk to you afterwards. So of course she says when you observe them in there, they're only in there for a few minutes when you know it's just a cacophony of kids having fun and enjoying themselves and they're they're trying to reach out and get into the the Lego and everything else. Um, and they have to remind them that no, your job today is just to watch. So then at the end of the um, detention served, then these students, she tells them that, uh, and the second piece of your detention is that you have to come back to the next team club, and you get to play with everything, and you get to teach a younger student. Um, you get to help them, not show them how to do things, but you help support them. And they were just like, she got hugs and everything that she wasn't expecting from these kids. Um, they suddenly started thriving. They found themselves a tribe to hang out with. By the end of the school year, uh, 22 and about 24 were successful. So it's making a huge difference. I was just going to say they need to make that that into a movie or something. Yeah, right? like I had, I almost makes me emotional. That's when lovely. I heard about it because it was yeah. Just so, I did go and witness some of these steam clubs and talk to the teachers, and it was really something to see that transformation in just a few short months that made such a difference in these children's lives. And behavior, like um, that was a big issue. You know, there was a lot of lot of um, sometimes angry, very frustrated students. Like it wasn't uncommon for like maybe a chair to be tossed around the classroom or walk into a classroom and it's absolute chaos and bedlam in some schools. And uh, any of the schools that have implemented the STEAM club, it's just like dialed down everything. So these kids have a focus now. They have a place to belong. They have a place to channel their energy. They're bringing into something positive, and it's also helping their vocabulary. It's developing some uh, leadership skills, maybe some of their other deficient areas that aren't even STEM-related are being improved just because of this experience. So. 
That's very cool. Right? Yeah. That's another great uh, thing to put under your hats in terms of the why, right? And the impact that you're having by being part so of this watch program. Watch that stuff because you'll, you'll just love it. You'll just see it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So around facilitating a lesson. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, this is I'm going into now a little bit more of the logistics and stuff, less of the theoretical things, more of the tactics. And um, we do have on our website, we have a number of activities. This is basically what they look like. And we put together this format because we think this gives you everything you need to know. It's a grade level it's recommended for. This is the time that you spend ahead of time or the teacher spends ahead of time. Amount of time the activity is to be run in. You can do a little bit of scaling if you want to. Materials you'll need. Vocabulary you'll introduce. Sometimes the teacher will really want to focus on a certain part of the curriculum. They'll say, look, I really need to teach momentum. Do you have anything on momentum? And you go, ah! Honestly, you can Google it. You can find it anywhere. If anyone's a fan of Pinterest or if you know about Pinterest, that's a great place to find STEM activities for kids. We're not saying you have to use the activities that we give you. However, we've already taken the time to come out with, uh, sorry, it was supposed to show the other sections here. Further down, it says a link to engineering, right? So you, you can really clearly give them, okay, here, here are a few ways you can talk about momentum in this way, or in this case, it's about sustainability. Um, Again, you can completely make it up. We're com we're, we authorize you to go ahead and create your own activities. We know that not everyone is going to have the motivation or time to do that because that is basically a big part of the teacher's job is coming up with lesson plans. Um, but you, yeah, you can use what we have or or not. It doesn't it doesn't really matter. We just want you to know that that is there for you if you need it. Different learning styles. Uh, again, there's there's much more to talk about here, but we have the highest uh, retention. Actually, when people teach something, that's like the, the gold standard. If you can get them to teach something, that's when they retain the most. Um, hearing it, playing with playing with it, uh, getting their hands on it tactically um, really ups the absorption as well. If they just hear it or just see it or just read it, it's a much lower retention level. So something as well to, to keep in mind. Um, so this is a Howard, uh, Howard Gardner, who is a Harvard uh, psychologist. Uh, talked about the theory of multiple intelligences. And we love this because it does not presume that you've got some kids that are at the top of the heap and they're the best, they're the elite, they're the smart, and then everybody else, right? It's saying everyone is smart in their own way. Higher education, you know, may or may not be a fit. Trades may or may not be a fit, but everybody has, every pot has a lid, right? Everyone has a path where they're going to thrive the most. And there is no we encourage actually as little judgment and stigma around any of it as possible. Some of those jobs are really well paid, some of them not so much. Some of these jobs are very creatively fulfilling, some of them not so much. Um, find where you fit, find what you're good at, and, and follow that. And again, I think this is a good reminder. I know definitely myself as an engineer going through my undergrad education, you do sometimes get into that sort of competition and hierarchical thinking about like, oh, the people who get the best marks are the smartest. Well. No, not necessarily. Sometimes they do terribly in the workplace, right? Because they don't know how to talk to people. So again, just that reminder, um, Tracy, I think you said it really well earlier as well, that everyone brings something to the table. So so referring to that and remembering that is, is a really good uh, approach also. There's a whole bunch of text, but again, this is just, again, to say, we don't expect you to come and deliver a lecture, you know, talk at the kids. I think we probably know if we're gonna use activities we're going to be engaging. We're going to create a lot more of that positive experience. Um, again, communication being one way, we don't really want that. We want it to be shared. Information is shared. Anytime you can empower them to find their own solutions, holy cow, you're now just really firing on all cylinders as far as giving them that, that positive taste of their own power, their own ability to solve things. Um, focusing not just on on uh, answering questions or being the expert, in this case this would be the volunteer, is the expert, um, if, as much as you can turn it back to them, ask them about their experiences, coach them along the way, encourage them, tell them what you see in them, that's very powerful also. Discussion, focusing on the process, I really like this one because I'm a process engineer, focus on the process, right, get the swing right and the home runs will come, that's pretty big. Um, again, it, it really depends. This is, there, these are a lot of sort of loose guidelines, I would say, but just to get you thinking about being more on the right-hand side um, than the left-hand side, this is, again, one of my personal favorites, that 
subjects in school don't actually exist. <laughs> we made up those divisions because we had to organize it somehow, right? But in real life, you've got geography, you've got economics, you've got, you know, psychology, you've got everything happening in a workplace. And it's just a concession to human uh, limitations that we break things up that way. So why would we get kids to put themselves in a category when they can, uh, they can understand a lot of the different uh, subjects as interconnected? Question? Comment? No? Okay. Um, so again, this is just a, a little bit of a reinforcement of some of those things. Um, engage lots of different senses. So I was volunteering with my professional engineering chapter at a, uh, it was called Shad Valley. It was like a, a science and math fair for grade seven and eight students to encourage them to keep up their maths and, and things. So we we're in this beautiful hotel ballroom and we had this great display behind us and we had these really expensive little tattoos that said engineering rocks, right? And we had everything all laid out on the table and the kids were just running around the ballroom. They were doing just whatever they wanted. We could not get the kids to stay in front of our booth, which was so expensive and perfectly curated, right, for more than about 15 seconds. They would grab the tattoos and run away. And when I looked around and saw where were they actually sticking, where were they like two and three deep around this booth that was across the way from us? It was the Engineers Without Borders booth from the University of Waterloo. And they had a little science fair style felt board with a few pictures of people on there uh, doing an agricultural development project in Africa. And they had a bucket of rice with wooden blocks in it. And the kids were in there squishing the rice with the blocks and having a fantastic time. And they were explaining to them how basic technologies can empower people and better their way of life. And that was a big aha for me. It's not about how fancy it is or how polished it is or how expensive it is. It's about engaging them. That really, <laughs> that bucket of rice kicked our butts, <laughs> right? And they did it for a fraction of the cost, but it was way more engaging and way more interesting for the kids. So be that bucket of rice. Don't be the expensive tattoos. Um, using new material, um, recognition and encouragement, I think we pretty much got asking them to present their work early on. That's an interesting piece because getting them to explain what it was, you can layer in a whole other set of learning there, right? I'm going to ask you to, I don't know, build a tower and then explain your process. Talk about the importance of communication. Um, this is great. So self-evaluation, uh, getting them to reflect and, uh, and do as much of that themselves as possible. FAQs. Okay. So what do you do? Hopefully I'm painting a pretty clear picture, but in case I haven't, I'm going to fill in the extra details here. Tell your story. We have a whole webinar on how to do that. Maybe you have some ideas based on what I've shared so far. Don't just jump in and make it, you know, talk about the uh, about the, the material. Talk about yourself as well. Provide some context for them. Let them get to know you a little bit. Um, equal partnership with the teacher. Why is this important? Remember what we said at the top about that gender thing? Most likely that teacher standing in front, statistically, it's probably female. Most of you are male. You come in, you elbow the teacher aside, say, okay, kids, I'm going to tell you about math and science, sends the wrong message, right? When you're there speaking with the teacher, co-presenting, um, sort of deferring to them uh, at times, that sends a very different message, and it's much better. Funny, because I'm with a guy, so maybe I'll be saying the right message when I push mm -hmm. him out of the way. Okay, elbow him out of the way. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My money's on you. <laughs> so, so most likely, Tracy, you won't even have to say anything. Like, what I love to do, actually, is to say, can you tell I'm an engineer by looking at me? And, man, does that get some interesting responses. I'm talking about the ring, right? I'm trying to get them to see if they notice the ring, but also trying to mine, mine them for the stereotypes they might have. So, yep. anyway, you can experiment with that line of uh, conversation. Um, again, you're going to pre-plan with the teacher and deliver the activities. Um, they might support the curriculum, I think I mentioned that already, and we have a program guide on our website. I think if we could find some way too to maybe pull together that is you get out there and get your experience, whatever experience you use in or either process or demo or whatever, that we could have a place maybe internally that we could have on our LAN, mm -hmm. you know, a, a file or something. Um, I know the school boards are doing that, like with YouTube clips and videos, so that with the STEAM clubs, as teachers go around and do their, in the elementary system, do their things. You know, all the materials, this is what you need, these are the steps, this is a video of how we did it, this is what we learned. 
um, you could probably put it in there and then that would help support each other too, or you'll have each other to reach out to and say, hey, I've got something to do and I'm really stuck with your ideas. That's great. I believe part of our commitment to you, Sue, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we're going to facilitate a conversation after you start. So we'll do that kind of a conversation. Mm -hmm. I think we'll, we'll do it maybe by a, by a conference call and, sure. and provide that type of feedback and, and, and also reflecting yourself like, hey, what would I have done differently? Or, you know, um, it'd also be good to know, like if you were playing an activity with the, your match, like your teacher, yep. match, you could send an email out. Has anyone done this yet? Yes. What are the challenges or? Yeah, I know for our engineer in residence program, we have a LinkedIn profile, uh, a LinkedIn group, pardon me, where people post oh. that kind of thing. So we we could discuss how yeah, to make it happen. I know. Have to solve how we do it tonight. But for sure. Like, you know that you're not going to just set loose and. Hundred percent. Float in the wind or something like that. That's we are here to support you. Together. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Good. Good reminder. Um. So questions. Um, so this is a guideline, one visit per month per volunteer. Many people do less than that because just logistics and scheduling and time availability. Um, any time that you can spend in the classroom is better than no time. So um, that is our sort of a guideline. The schools and teachers needs and goals, um, sort of when are you going to review to meet your goals? Have these folks received their match emails, Sue? Do you know? Yeah, you have? Okay, you I know who your teacher is? I have too, yeah. Awesome. Okay, have you been in contact with your matches at all? I have. Okay. I have tried. So this is exactly where you... I haven't received a response. Oh, you reached out? I don't think I... Because Rebecca emailed thing. Okay. Yeah, your matches. Me too, I want to do this first. Perfect. Okay, so... They, you know, anytime you can integrate your perspective to enhance the curriculum, that's ideal. It doesn't have to be related to the curriculum, though. Your story sort of goes with everything, right? Yeah, you can add that on to anything. Um, what is the volunteer interested in doing? That's a question for the teachers, obviously. Teacher, student again. Um, important messages. Again, these are things that you can brainstorm with your teachers. And again, we're going to give you this, so just... Flip to the slide if you want, it, uh, a bit of a guideline or, or script for your conversation. Um, and when are you going to meet next? I guess we, we asked that there. So we trust you to manage that relationship with the teacher and, and do something and make a plan that, that fits with your schedules. And uh, we have some resources for you. We do have a newsletter, and if you want to sign up for that, we, we send out sort of, hey, here's something that's working kind of thing. We highlight it from across the different programs that we run, so you're welcome to sign up for that if you're interested. Um, we do have some things online. I think we mentioned our YouTube channel. That's the main thing. Um, we can take the presentations and post them, or we could do something more specific to Bruce Power. I think we're open to suggestions on that. It just depends on what our firewall allows mm -hmm. from your benefits. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Leah. I don't think it stops anybody from using their own like personal account to access that if they want to receive the newsletter. That's really okay. Amazing. Cool. Yeah, so that sounds good. So again, that's our website, engineersoftomorrow.ca, and I guess we do have a LinkedIn group for EOT volunteers as well. So I didn't really explain, but engineers of tomorrow, that's that's Becky and I. So <laughs> we've been doing this uh, for about the last six years, most of that full time um, between the two of us. So. A few other things that we have, um, we asked some volunteers, what advice would you have for folks who are just starting out? And these were the biggest messages that they gave. So be realistic. That That is mostly to do with time commitment. You don't want to go and over promise and end up under, under delivering, which doesn't exactly go well in the relationship with the teacher. Pretty obvious, plan ahead. I'm sure all of us got where we are by being pretty good planners and executors. Um, remember, have fun. Nobody gets injured if something goes wrong in the classroom, right? It's not its not a matter of life and death. If you try something and it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, be creative, I guess, and, and work together. Creativity and teamwork. That's sort of what they gave us. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so I was going to give you some planning time, again, for the purposes of today. We would normally sort of have everyone stand up, go find your match, and do some planning. Um, we're going to skip over that for the purposes of today, but hopefully you all know what you need to do in terms of next steps and planning with your match. And here's what it looks like we do the orientation, I guess, October slash November. Hopefully you can get into the classroom once your um, police checks come back. 
Um, we'll do a mid-year check-in, which basically just means we send you an email, say, hey, how's it going? <laughs> we might give you a form to fill out a couple of questions on some of your highlights and what you're up to. Basically, it's our job to sort of help support you, make sure that the relationship goes well. We send a similar email to your teacher as well. So obviously, if there are things that are working well, not working well, your first point of contact is with the teacher. But obviously, if you don't feel comfortable or if there's something comes up that you feel you can't handle, do reach out to us because that's our job to help you help support you with that stuff. Um, round May, we're going to reach out to you and say, do you want to sign up for another year? And you are very welcome at that point, if it doesn't fit with your schedule, to say no. But we hope that you'll say yes. And then um, if we reach out to the teacher at the same time. And if you both say yes, then you get matched for another year. Anytime there's a disconnect, we we patch you up with somebody else, right? We that's Again, we're matchmakers, so that's what we end up doing. We ask you for some heads up to let us know in May, because then by June, we can begin the rematching um, year-end process. There's some recognition. Over the summer, things go into pretty neutral gear, but we've had good success the past few years by running what we call a summer webinar series. So these are just things. We run them generally at 12.30 and 5.30, so hopefully you can make that work in your schedule. We do offer the replay, uh, the video replay afterwards um, that you can watch anytime, and there's sort of a deeper dive on a lot of the topics we've, we've just, just touched the surface of today. Okay. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming and for making the time. I think we're nicely ahead of schedule, which is good for a Monday night, and it's really dark out. <laughs> um, here we go. I was hoping I'd get a chance to introduce us. So this is me here. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I do have my own consulting firm. I work mostly with uh, automotive clients right now. I used to work for Magna, where I got my Six Sigma black belt. Um, and now I also do this engineering outreach stuff because it's really fun and it was a great partnership with Engineers Without Borders Canada. Um, and we recently, uh, together, Becky and I, just founded Engineers of Tomorrow as a not-for-profit organization. So there's a little bit about us. Uh, Becky and I went to school together and we actually worked at Science Quest, which is a science and engineering camp for kids. So we can literally say we've been doing this for about 25 years, <laughs> the two of us. And uh, yeah, it just keeps getting better. So we're really pleased to work with you, pleased to support you. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. Our email addresses are there. And again, we'll provide a copy of these slides. <laughs>